Hello, everyone. Welcome to Press XY Presents. We accept you. Just don't use the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, we have a little bit of bad news. Uh, Janelle Jayquays and Rebecca Heineman aren't going to be able to be with us today. They've had some travel trouble, and they're on the West Coast. Uh, however, Janelle has prepared a video for us that we're going to watch later on tonight, or later on in this panel. Uh, so I'm Charles Battersby. Hello. Uh, I'm a video game writer. Uh, I've uh, been a journalist for theater and in video games for about 20 years. I've also been an out-of-the-closet cross-dresser for about 20 years as well. Uh, and with me is Eric Patterson. Hi, I am Eric, um, otherwise known as Shidoshi by anybody who knows my pen name. Uh, I currently work for this little magazine here called Electronic Gaming Monthly, a.k.a. EGM. Um, I have also worked for magazines such as Play and Game Fan back in the day. Uh, I do a litany of other stuff, podcasts such as Warning a Huge Podcast and all the other things. And um, I will get into my situation when we get to that part of the show. So. And we're going to be joined in a few minutes by Maggie Baker, who's a tabletop game designer uh, and a sex ed teacher, and she'll be speaking with us uh, in just a few minutes. She's on her way. Uh, but for now, since the theme of today's panel is past, present, and future, we're going to take a little look back at how transgender people were portrayed in the gaming industry only about 14 years ago. So some of you may remember this old Nintendo commercial. And this is a real Nintendo commercial for the N64 from about uh, the year 2000. Son, life isn't all about money. Nah, family, health, happiness, those are the important things. And I guess what I'm really trying to say is, how much will it cost to keep this from your mother? $39.95! That's all you need for these super cool Nintendo 64 games. All best sellers and all players' choice. Hey, at these prices, maybe you can get two. Grandpa? Hated E for everyone. Okay, so how many people remember when that commercial aired? How many people were shocked or outraged or personally insulted by it? Okay, only a few people were really shocked and insulted. Uh, but the message that we're getting uh, from only two console generations ago was that transgender people are the butt of the joke, that it's a source of shame, and you can blackmail your parents uh, who cross dress into buying you Nintendo products. <laughs> so um, let's shut down that. All right, and now let's, we'll discuss past, present, and future of uh, video games. Um, but joining us just now is Maggie Baker. Hello. Uh, Sorry to be late. <laughs> uh, Eric and I have already introduced ourselves. So, Maggie, okay. if you can tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm Maggie Baker. I write role-playing games, and I teach sex ed. And um, so this is a place I'm very interested in. Um, what else about me? I... I don't know if there's anything else super fascinating or interesting. I'm sorry to have missed your, your introductions, but uh, that's where I'm at. All right, well, now we'll uh, each take a turn talking about uh, how the old days used to be. Now, I've been uh, an out-of-the-closet cross-dresser for about 20 years. Uh, this is long before video games were a major cultural influence. I started by working in theater, and when you work in theater... Uh, People really just see cross-dressing or gender play as part of your day job, and it's really no big deal to come out uh, and you know tell your theater buddies, oh, by the way, um, I don't just you know wear a dress when I'm doing a Shakespeare play. I also do it uh, whenever I feel like. So, but with the video game industry, um, it's a little more controversial. Other mediums, especially television, um, used to be very conservative uh, and. It seems that transgender people are the last civil rights barrier to be broken, that companies that are uh, very overt about uh, discussing how tolerant they are of religious or ethnic or sexual preferences, uh, they would clam up and become very hostile towards transgender people. And that was only uh, 15, 10 years ago. Uh, and over the last decade, there's been a drastic change that's occurred. Um, but in terms of the gaming industry, um, we had a lot of people in the 90s and the 80s, classic game designers, 
who uh, had their careers ruined because they came out of the closet. And these are industries that it wouldn't be a big problem if they had just come out of the closet as being gay, but there is over transphobia. And a lot of the classic game designers um, who came out, uh, they've resigned from game making. There's a few brave ones that have stayed in the industry that are carrying the banner for a new generation. And it's reached the point that a major con like, like PAX will do numerous transgender-specific panels uh, over the course of it's been two years running now at PAX East. And uh, I've been pretty lucky with my transition, uh, coming from an industry where no one really cares if you're a cross-dresser, and coming into the game industry. There was never really a moment where I had to come out of the closet. It was just something everybody knew. And Eric? So my my situation is a little bit interesting because um, I'm still in the position of not transitioning yet uh, as male to female. Um, But... I've been kind of out with this for a few years, um, and when I was a very young child, it, you kind of know that like things are going on, but you don't know exactly what is going on, and I remember the fact that my mother had made me a uh, stormtrooper outfit so I could dress up as a stormtrooper, but she had also made me a Princess Leia outfit so I could dress up as Princess Leia. And as a child, I, I never thought that that was anything strange, you know? And my mother never said, oh, you're not supposed to do that. You know? So I, I was lucky in that regard, but in a same, similar way, um, I didn't totally understand what was going on because I just thought that was normal. You know, I had my He-Man characters and I had my My Little Ponies, which, of course, I guess now is okay. <laughs> guys, <laughs> you know, times have changed a little bit. Uh, so I never really realized that. But, you know, as I started growing older and I was like, wait a minute, something's not right with how I feel and how things are going on for me things got very confused and the way this starts to connect to video games is that right out of high school I started at Game Fan Magazine which some of you who are younger will not know that um, that it was a very very big magazine back in the day and I went there and very very quickly found out that video games are a boys club they were and unfortunately they still kind of are Uh, and the things that made me different made me very much stand out. And I received a lot of pushback from my coworkers because of that. I had a few friends who were accepting of me to some degree, but they were still like, okay, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Uh, I remember one time the fact that it came up that I uh, shaved parts of my body that maybe men shouldn't be shaving. You know, and that was a huge ordeal at the offices of GameFan because I, I did that. You know, and at that point, so I really didn't understand, but I had to work very hard to keep that side of me repressed and keep it away. And I think part of that is the reason why it took me so long to really come to understand what my situation was. Uh, and I, a few years ago, did finally figure that out, started dealing with it. But my situation at that point was the fact that, um, and I'm not saying I'm any kind of celebrity by any means, but I did have people who knew who I was uh, through Game Fan, through the magazine I worked for at the time, Play Magazine, through my uh, various you know, fan projects or whatever. I had people who knew me, and that was kind of terrifying. Uh, you know, in your own world, whatever, you know, whoever you are, whatever you are, if you have a secret that you're kind of hiding and that you decide, I'm going to tell other people, that can be a very, very frightening thing. You know, how is my family going to react? How are my friends going to deal with this? You know, what are the people around me going to think? You know, in my situation, I had that, and then I had all these people who were talking to me over my history of stuff and saying, oh, I loved because of this, that, you know, I follow you and everything. And I was like, oh, my God, how are people going to react? Um, so that was kind of a weird thing for me. And, and I'm, I'm actually not officially completely out about this. So it's like my, the worst kept secret that I've ever had. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like I talk about it and I don't make it a big deal. But I don't just come out and say, hey, I'm trans. Woo, you know. Although technically you just did. Uh, yeah, I guess Yay! Yeah. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> you know, and, and to kind of wrap this up, um, the one thing I've found and the one kind of point I want to really hit on is, you know, we, we're going to talk about companies, we're going to talk about game developers, publishers, things like that, and how they deal with the trans issue. But one of the places I've been the uh, proudest and also the most disappointed is the community. Um, 
you know, for a lot of you out there in this audience, I'm sure you're not trans, but you have something about you. You have something inside you. You have some quirk, or you have some personality trait, or you are a certain way. You are who you are. And it used to be a time when gamers were shunned, you know? We, we were the weirdos in our basements playing games in the dark, you know? We were inside doing this weird hobby when we should be outside playing softball or soccer or riding our bikes and everything. And so for so many years and for so long, we were you know, ostracized from the world because we played video games. And we had to say, we're going to rise up and get beyond that, and we're going to be gamers, and we're going to be proud, you know? And, and that's great, and that's out there. But in our community, then, we stab each other in the back a lot of the time. You know, we are not accepting. I mean, look at the issues recently with female gamers. You know, f female gamers still have so much to go through, and, and they still have so much crap slung at them by the gaming community. And that is half of the people in the entire world, you know? When you start bringing us down into smaller and smaller groups, then it's, it's like, okay, maybe I can understand if I'm in some fringe little group that doesn't have that much uh, presentation out there, but female gamers alone are getting this. And we as a community have to come together and say whoever we are, whatever we are, you know, we are, I mean, I don't necessarily want to say I want to rally around being gamers, but we are gamers, you know, we play video games no matter what it is, and gosh darn it, can't we all just be friends and can't we all just enjoy games together and can't we all say, hey, we're in the same little community, we're a family, and let's support one another. So, you know, my personal thing in this has been seeing the good and seeing how nice people can be and how res responsive and respectful and receptive people can be in my talking about my situation. The downside is there's still a lot of people out there who not only don't care, but they don't want to care. And they don't care about finding out who you are. So... And Maggie. Um, okay, so my angle on this as, is as a publisher, as a game designer. And one of the things that's important to me looking at uh, gender issues in game design is uh, twofold. One is to be sure that the people that I'm hiring, I'm hiring people, not genitalia. Um, the people that I'm working with the attitudes I want to have in my game design and in the people that, I'm, that I have around me have the level of inclusiveness and diversity and interest in who you are. I think that was a brilliant comment. You know, being interested in who you are matters. Like I don't, as a game designer, what I want most is for you to enjoy playing the game I'm making. I don't care really about anything else. You know, you could be, I, I really don't care. Like, you know, and part of my game design involves, like, I want to have themes and uh, details of in my game design that support some of the cultural shift I want to see. Because I really do believe in being part of uh, changing my own microculture and looking at how we can move past the ideas of, you know, this is what gamers should be and this is the little boxes you should put yourselves in and looking at how we change our microculture in the directions we want it to go. So if I'm wanting to be more aware of gender diversity, I have to walk the walk and I have to have that in my game design. So if I write my game design, I'm like um, in Apocalypse World, which is... Uh, Vincent Baker's game, my husband's game, um, that I've had a lot of input on. When you get to the place where you're talking about is your character, ex whatever, it's like, is your character a man, a woman, transgender, concealed, um, ambiguous? You know, so looking beyond a, a bipolar vision in my game design, even if people default to a, a more limited scope, raising the question so that the visibility is there in, my, in game design. Um, and th that permeates my whole attitude as a designer to be a, a raising the question. Some of, some of the game design that I do is more uh, like emphatic than others. There are, some, there are games that are very distinctly dealing with issues of sexuality and gender and expression. Some of them, it's not really there at all. But I want the questions to be raised. I want them to be raised through my art. I want them to be raised through my mechanics. I want them to be part of what I'm thinking of in the process of designing. That I'm not just designing for you know, this little segment, 
whatever that segment is, but that I'm designing in a way that's accessible um, and that's flexible. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about gender, is that it's flexible. That's so cool. Uh, you know, it's my favorite bit. Uh, and to have that show up in my game design, that if you want to play, you know, you want to play someone who's like cisgendered, that's their thing, and it's like hardcore, and then do their thing. Okay, cool. uh, and for those of you that don't know the term cisgendered, uh, that's the polite way of saying right. not transgendered. Yeah, and like that, that this is like a, a, an education moment, like a teachable moment that in my game design too of saying, be aware of these terms. You know that there's more that there's there's more out there in the world of sexual expression and the world of gender expression than you probably know, than I probably know. One thing that I had to really come to recently in my game design was being sure that I was like, oh, you know, there are people who really identify as asexual. Like so. Think about that, Meg. You know, next to think about that. What's that mean for my game design? So having all these issues of how how uh, gender diversity um, and expression diversity shows up in my game design is something I take seriously. And when I and I look very critically, not in terms of like, oh, that's bad, but in terms of critique of other game design. Say, where is that on this uh, on these various sliders? Where where is this? game? How, what is this hitting? What is this saying? What is this saying to the teenagers that I work with? What sort of, what's going on with this game? Um, so that's really, that's where I'm coming out this from. Yeah. That's great that uh, your company's doing that. And there are some other companies. Uh, I was very surprised to learn that um, some major gaming and tech companies have been praised by the Human Rights Campaign uh, for being exceptionally aware of uh, LGBT issues. And among them are some very major game publishers and some other companies like Electronic Arts, mm -hmm. GameStop, and Cisco, uh, and also uh, some other big tech companies, Apple and Windows, have both gotten very high ratings from the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, the Human Rights Campaign doesn't lump together LGBT issues all together in one big group. They have separate categories so that when they rate a company, they're making sure that there's a distinguishing between gay and transgender issues. And so all of these companies mentioned here and a few others that you can find on the, HR, on the uh, HRC website, uh, those have all been uh, given a rating according to how well they have transgender-specific hiring practices and non-discrimination clauses. And uh, there are uh, organizations that have kept track of just how many companies will have transgender-specific regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, one organization said that it was about 2% of companies had transgender specific ordinances in their uh, employee codes back in 2002 and now a mere 11 years later it's drastically risen so that most companies actually have some specification that says you uh, can't discriminate against someone just for being transgender mm -hmm. even if that person considers themselves to be heterosexual mm -hmm. and uh, also this is a chart by the uh, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which shows how different states have legislation that's specific to transgender issues. And as you can see here, it varies drastically from state to state, depending on where you happen to live at the time. And cities themselves will have stricter regulations beneath that. So even though there are federal civil rights laws, um, they aren't necessarily as strict as we would like. And each state or city, you can contact your uh, congressman about getting your state's laws to be a little stricter about not discriminating against just transgender people, uh, because that, that's something that often gets left out of LGB, uh, LGBT organizations. Yeah, I, I want to say that, that there, if you read the news at all, you'll see that there's a lot of issues where, um, you know, the, and, and, and not to say, I always want to be careful because I don't want to say anybody's struggle is, is worse than somebody else's or anything like that. You don't want to make direct comparisons. But um, when the, the, the gay and lesbian uh, uh, like laws relating to those kind of people or, or issues like that are going on, a lot of times the transgender issue is left out. 
and there are issues still about uh, employment issues and other social issues like one that is just going on now that some of you might have heard of and I don't have the exact details I apologize because of the rush to get ready for PACS East and everything and GDC and whatnot but Arizona right now is working on a law about bathrooms uh, saying that if you are a transgender and let's say that you were, you were born male but you, you are transitioned to female and you are presenting as female that unless you have a piece of paper saying that you are indeed female they, they do not want you using female bathrooms they are going as far as saying like that you have to like technically show your papers you know in order for you to use the bathroom and the argument brought up a lot of times in this case especially is that um, a guy is going to dress up as a woman go in the woman's bathroom and then molest little girls and we have to stop that so we have to have laws like this and of course that's ridiculous you know uh, people who are going to molest somebody are going to molest somebody no but matter know. what you know those, those are very bad people and, and a law is not going to stop them so there's still a lot of work there's still a lot of, of fear about transgender people you know that, that comes either through a lack of knowledge or just not liking them or whatever but there's a lot of fear out there and so you know you see on this kind of map just how diverse states are in their laws and in their protections and there are there's still a huge lack of protection I mean there's still tons and tons of places where you can get you know fired just for being trans, even if you're not even if you're not even transitioning, which we use it's missing against you. So mm-hmm. yes, and a lot of this hostility comes from the stereotype of the predatory uh, trickster transgender person who dresses as a disguise to lure in innocent men for our fiendish plans. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also part of it is uh, it's a, a subjective viewpoint where the observer is thinking, you're dressing like that to screw with my head, <laughs> not because you're dressing like that because you like those aesthetics. And so that's one mindset uh, that we need to focus on kind of breaking through, that I'm not dressed like this uh, to trick anyone. I'm dressing like this just because I happen to like it. And if you were at the panel last year, which I don't know if any of you were, uh, the one we did here at PAX East, uh, one of the things I brought up in that was the, the, the internet term trap, you know, if, you, if you've heard of trap. And that's the, oh, it's the, the cute young boy who's dressing as a cute young girl to trap somebody. And that's, that's still one of the, the perception issues that, the, that people who are transgender have is, like Charles just said, the mm-hmm. fact that we are doing what we're doing not because it's who we are and that's because that's what we want to be, but because we want to involve you somehow. <laughs> you know? And we are so concerned with somehow getting something over on you that we are going to actually go to these great lengths. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, if I can add a couple of points, there's two things. One from like my sex ed background. Um, it is more likely that you will be struck by lightning than molested by a stranger, like especially as a child. Like if you're if you're under if you're under like 13, it's more likely that you're going to be struck by lightning than molested by a stranger. But the fear that gets put in to our culture and our children, um, I have three kids, two of them are teenagers. They're you know, the fear that gets put into them is strangers. Like you know, what about your coach or your crossing guard or your priest? You know. All these things. So this, the fear that gets layered on top of, you know, not knowing, like, because uh, you know, some people still are in that space where they're they don't know, like, what do I do? What do I? How do I? What pronouns do you want me to use? You know, it's a thing. Um, so there's that. Just from the background. Just real quick, for you, when I, I want to say that to back up your statement about the fact that it's not, it's it's not a stranger to somebody close to yeah. you. Yeah. Well, like what what Charles was saying about like oh someone dressing like that someone who's dressing cross dressing and they're doing it in a way to like lure children in I'm like this is crap and like we know it's crap but the data like looking at the scientific data analysis like it's more likely that you'd be struck by lightning and I was just gonna say that I, I don't have the scientific data behind that but um, I have watched enough Law and Order SVU to get that. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so that's a, a huge thing. And then like the other part is looking at um, the fear angle, which I think Charles also mentioned. And like we wind up living in a world if you, if we go back if you go back two hundred years, um, everyone who is wearing pants in this room, you are male. That's how it goes. Sorry, because because the way that we the way that dress 
shapes, you know, the, the way that it marks people in their roles in society, in their gender roles, in their, you know, status issues in terms of uh, socioeconomics. That's all really transitory. You know, we, we can find places through history where everything is different. Look at different places in the world, and it's like, oh, everybody wears dresses all the time. I was just in Ethiopia. Guys wearing dresses all the time. No, what? Why would this be an issue? Because that's where that's how they dress. So I, I all think these I would questions. Be the height. Oh, sorry. That, that, so all these issues of how you dress. You know, why why is this still a question? Why are we sitting here in 2013, and the map looks like that instead of just you know high all the way across? That's my question. Oh, and uh, we have a video from Janelle Jaquez that we'd like to show. Uh, but first, I'd just like to talk a little bit um, about how the future, based on the progress that we've seen over the last um, few decades, where mm-hmm. there has been uh, a much greater focus on tolerance and understanding of transgender people. Um, the progress is coming. Uh, not as fast as I'd like to see it. We still have both The Simpsons and Saturday Night Live using transgender people as the butt of their jokes uh, just as recently as last month. And if- I was going to say, though, that um, I don't know if any of you watched the NBC sitcom Whitney. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't, there was a recent episode called Lost in Transition where Whitney's uh, half-sister comes out as being uh, female to male. Um, and that show amazed, did an amazing job of handling it. I mean, you're always going to have little things like, okay, they could have done this better or that better, but they show this character coming out, they show this character going to the doctor and talking about the serious issues, they got the terminology all correct. Uh, it, it, was, it was really amazing to see the fact that this is a half-hour sitcom where you don't think you're going to have an in-depth, you know, a, a great look at the issue of being transgender, but it was. Um, so, as many bad examples as there are, there, there are starting to be some mm-hmm. good examples. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the places that I see that very strongly is, believe it or not, with teenagers. Um, in my children's school, there is both a teacher who is a F to M, female to male, uh, transition. Seamless. Like, the only thing we got was we got a note from the school saying, oh, by the way, this teacher is going to go by a different <laughs> name now. <laughs> That was it. Nobody cares. Um, <laughs> it's the f- favorite English teacher in the school. Um, and then the other thing, the bathroom, as you mentioned earlier, like I was at a dance for seventh and eighth grade kids earlier this year, and one of the kids came in. She's like, "Wow, she's what a cute kid she is." Doll dolled up for her seventh grade dance, and then it, it's clear because I didn't know her very well. One of the teachers, she went and talked, which is like. I'm going to go to the bathroom. And then she stopped and asked the teacher, like, oh, which, which bathroom should I use? <laughs> it was cool, you know, this little conversation. And then it felt, it's like, well, you know, go with your biology for now. And you could see in him, he's like, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. But it was a seventh grader who was totally out at a <laughs> dance. And I was like, Anyway, so that's where I see the future and the change, and I, I totally think that it's happening. Like, the map is going to roll, and it's going to happen because, like you said, with the sitcom, you know, Lost in Transition, things happen, and we see, uh, we see media moving culture, and we saw it with Ellen when Ellen came out, and we all know Ellen came out, and we all know how cool Kurt is, because if you don't, Okay, thank you, somebody, yay. Okay, um, so places where, where uh, culture shifts, and it shifts in little bits and it shifts in big bits, and I think the Lost in Transition episode is a really kind of a big moment. I'm really excited is, about that. There is, um, you mentioned about the teacher aspect, mm-hmm. and there is a, a very unfortunate story that just came out from the UK, and again, I apologize for not knowing the exact names in this case, but it was somebody who was uh, male to female, and she had transitioned, and she was a teacher at a school in the UK, and somebody at the Daily Mail uh, just totally reamed her in the paper, uh, said, you know, oh, look at this freak doing this, and that she was hurting her children by doing it, and that not only should she uh, not have uh, become a female, but she should have a totally different job. She should not be around children at all. And it, the the news story this week was the fact that she killed herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you can't directly say, okay, this led to this, but we know the issue of bullying. I mean, you know, uh, 
even past the issue of being transgender, you know, bullying is a, a huge problem. Uh, and that is definitely a case where I think that's, that's what led her to do that. Because when, when you care, you know, I have to assume that she was, she was a, a good person. She was not trying to hurt her children. And doing what she had to do for her life is not anything against her children that, that you know, she was teaching. And then to have somebody, that's, I guess, what I'm trying to say is the fact that, that that's the problem, um, you know, with anything, is that if you decide I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it, not to the whims of other people, that is one of the issues that you face, is, is people not just saying I disagree with you, but saying I disagree with you and I think you're a horrible person and I am going to rally against you, you know. And so we, it's like one step forward half a step back I, I would like to be hopeful and say half a step back yeah you know yeah. but so we do have to make these issues and and we have to realize that i there was a panel last last year here at pax east about the uh issues females face in the gaming community and one of the things that was brought up was that male gamers have to speak up you know if if you hear female gamers getting ridiculed online getting called names you know, you can't just sit there and stay silent. And that's with everything, is we can't stay silent, stay silent about other people's issues. You know, we can't say, I'm not that, so I'm not going to worry about it. And we have to come together and, and help each other. I know it's, it's hippie, <laughs> uh, new agey, you know, no, but we have to do that because right. if we don't, as a people, we are not going to progress. Well, it's, it's, it's right up from the 80s, you know, when, with the, when the AIDS epidemic was first hitting, and we had the silence equals death. You know, it does. You know, and speaking up is incredibly powerful. And we talk about the bystander effect. You all know what the bystander effect is? Yeah, cool. Um, for the heads that are not nodding, and there's a lot of them, which I'm glad of, it's this situation where you see something, but you don't say anything because you don't want to get involved. And you don't want to maybe offend somebody. Maybe someone's going to say something bad about you or it's going to turn on you. It's powerful, and it, it takes courage to say, you know, that, that joke was not cool. But it's also really small, you know? When you're on an online forum or something like that and someone says something derogatory and you don't like it, it's, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a giant confrontation. It can be like, oh, that wasn't cool. Okay, moving on. We're going to go back to doing what we're doing. You know, these, these tiny, tiny things of reinforcing the, show, the social shift that you want to see, saying, oh, not, not, you know, oh, I told a horrible joke. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, not so cool. Okay, moving on. I'm... Yeah, a, a problem that I've been getting more often, which I'm happy to see, is people that are struggling to find the polite thing to say. Um, <laughs> um, you know, b being here at PAX, a lot of uh, game companies know me by my name, Charles Battersby, and when I come up and say hello in my, my pencil skirt and pumps, uh, I, I will often hear, um, oh, hello, uh, ma'am, sir, and, <laughs> and these are people that they aren't uh, transphobic, they, they don't really care, uh, they just don't know the polite thing to do. And I, I try not to get outraged or uppity, uh, I just try to tell, you can address me as miss. <clears throat> <laughs> um, and what I'd say about that is, you know, everybody's different and, and I can't speak, for, I cannot be any kind of spokesman for anybody. Uh, so there are people in the, in the trans community who are, you know, who don't want to talk about their situations, who, who don't want to be out, who don't want to deal with that. But like in my situation, you know, if you've got a question, come up and ask me. Like, like I think the way that we progress is by people knowing more about something, you know. Mm. And I will never not want to inform you about something. And so I think if you don't know, that's fine. And you can say, I don't know. You know, it's, it's better to ask, come to trials and ask, how should I refer to you, you know, so that I don't insult you, than to just assume or just say, I'm going to walk and go somewhere else and not talk to this person because <laughs> I'm too paranoid and freaked out about it, you know? Like, ask questions. Ask if you can ask questions, you know, and then ask questions and, and ask what is right and wrong for that certain person. Like, don't be afraid to interact with people and, and find out what they want because I would rather a little bit of weirdness at the beginning when you're saying, um, I don't know how to talk to you. Can you inform me about that? Then, then you to not talk to me or you to not feel comfortable enough around me. I think it would be great if we got to a point where there was just an easy, like, easy part of talking to anybody was just like, oh, so what, what pronouns do you prefer? You know, what if that was just a part of it? Like, oh, what's your name? What pronouns do you prefer? You know, wouldn't that be cool? 
Thank you for the class. <laughs> yeah, and do it all the time, everyone. Yes. <laughs> No, you're totally right. <laughs> exactly true. In a lot of situations, I try really hard introduce myself and explicitly doing this even when I have a really strong feeling that this is a cisgendered person who has their preferred pronouns that match with the presentation and that there's... My sister looks entirely male, has no interest of doing anything to look female, but her preferred pronouns are feminine. No way to know that without asking. And if you don't make it normative to ask everybody every time, then somebody feels singled out because you're saying, hey, what are your preferred pronouns? And it's really super easy when you say, hi, my, my name's Pat, what's your name? What pronouns do you prefer? It, it, it's as simple as that. And Yay. I'm going to shut up. Uh, we'll have audience questions uh, in a few minutes, and you can tweet them. <laughs> so you can tweet them to uh, hashtag PressXY. Um, we're also going to watch uh, Janelle's video. Uh, but before we run the video, I just want to talk about one issue. Uh, another uh, happy problem that I, I'm always glad to have to deal with, uh, and that's what I call the vanity trap, where uh, people will sometimes praise a transgendered person mm -hmm. For conforming so well to their, you know, their new gender, or inform you of just how fascinating it is and interesting that you're a transsexual or a transvestite, and it's, you know, it's great that people are stroking your vanity with these compliments. Um, but ultimately, the goal is for people to not really care. It's just something you do. And I think part of the problem is, you know, if if you look at the porn industry. Uh, you know, the, the tranny is a huge fetish out there. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who transgender get, get fetishized all, all the time. So first, they are not fetishes, you know. Uh, they are human beings, remember that. And then also, it, you, you know, I, we know you mean well, but if you say, oh, man, you totally don't like a, look like a man anymore, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a great compliment to make, you know, I'm, unless they are female to male and they're trying to look like a man and you're saying, I don't know. Just be careful. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Cool. And um, we'll run Janelle's video right now uh, and then we will take uh, questions. You can line up in the center for that or you can hashtag your questions or tweet your hashtag your questions to uh, press XY. But let's run Janelle's video. And Janelle and Becky both uh, really wanted to be here today but they're stuck out in Seattle um, so they prepared this. Uh, the sound is a little low, so if everyone can cup your ear. Hi, I'm Janelle J. Quays, the Chief Creative Officer of Old School. I'm speaking to you, um, not quite live, here from my studio in downtown Seattle. So, a little bit about myself. I've been working in the game industry for a, a very long time. Let's just call it all my entire adult life. I started when I was in college doing artwork for role-playing games. Uh, soon got into writing adventures for them with a small publishing company called Judges Guild. Then went freelance for a year, then went to work for Coleco, the creators of, Ju of um, ColecoVision. I um, left the company when they kicked out everyone who was making video games during the video game crash of uh, 1984 to 1985. At that time, I was director of design. Every ColecoVision title that came out from Coleco came through my hands in some way or another. Um, I freelanced for a number of years as an artist and game designer, ending up at TSR, the original publishers of Dungeons & Dragons, working as a cover artist. From there, I stepped back into the video game industry uh, doing level design for id software, working on titles like Quake 2, Quake 3 Team Arena, uh, and Quake 3 Arena, forgot that one. From id, I stepped out back, I stayed in the uh, game industry, staying in Dallas, working on the Age of Empires titles, Age of Empires 3 in particular, in one of its uh, expansions, and then was an environment artist on 
Halo Wars doing their multiplayer game maps. His most recent position in the game industry was with CCP, the publishers of EVE Online. I was working on another MMO as their lead level designer, the World of Darkness MMO based on their mass, uh, Vampire the Masquerade game. So, obviously, at some point, I chose to stop being who I was and to let the real person come out. This started about two years ago. I started actually dealing with what I will, you know, the gender issue in my life. It had been there all along. So, what to do? I worked for the game industry. Everyone knew me for 30 some years as the name I was. How do I reconcile that with being myself for the rest of my life? Well, I knew from almost the very first that whatever I would do, it had to be public when I finally came out. And that's how I worked my transition. I started in the summer by getting together with another trans woman I worked with. We met with our HR department and tried to get them to convince, or tried to convince them to change their health care policy. After coming out to Human Resources, the next steps were to come out to my managers. Beginning with my immediate manager, I used a letter to come out to him. We read a, uh, he read a three-page letter I'd written to him over lunch and was immediately accepting. Uh, my next manager, the producer for the project, it took about a month to catch up with him. He was traveling constantly. Um, Finally, the way I came out was I sat in his office and over the course of less than five minutes just shared that I was trans. He said, basically, fine, you're not our first rodeo. Then I prepared to come out to the rest of the company, which included drafting the letter to the entire company, which I was also going to be a variant of the one that I drafted that for coming out to the entire world. The company letter had to be reviewed by senior management, which included the president of the company and the corporate attorney. They both played in the adventure game that I had been playing in for several months, and now they might get an insight into why the character I had been playing was female. So having come out to the company, I came out to the world. It was the right thing to do for me, the right thing to do for my career, and I do not regret it. All right, so while Janelle was talking, um, if everyone who wants to ask a question can line up in the center. We'll have an enforcer there with a wireless mic. Uh, but we did get a couple of tweeted questions in the last couple of minutes. And one person wants to know about trans-friendly games, uh, games and game characters. Um, Didn't you have a whole panel on that? We had a panel, uh, we had a panel last Same. year. Not, not to dodge the question, we had a panel last year. Uh, if you go to pressxy.com, we have that panel actually up that you can watch. <laughs> and we also have a panel coming on Sunday, which I think yeah. might be a little more geared towards that. Yes, we'll be talking at length about um, uh, what companies are doing a good job with making uh, transgender characters. Um, but the short answer on a, uh, a great character, a uh, great game for trans gamers would be Saints Row the Third. Mm -hmm. And we'll discuss more on Sunday. Cool. Uh, now, um, first question. Hi. Um, so I have a question. Um, I'm currently in my master's program. I'm working to become a higher education. Um, so I've worked in the college field. Specifically, I'm aiming towards diversity. I was just curious if there's any positions within the gaming industry that are specifically towards diversity and awareness. If there's a job within that that specifically, you go to that person, you know, they kind of, they, they're more aware of it, they go through games, you know, if, if there's any sort of position within the gaming industry that allows that. Well, almost any major uh, game company, whether it's a developer or publisher, will have an HR department with a compliance officer whose job is to specifically make sure that the company's yeah. rules on tolerance are enforced and uh, that would be a terrific job for someone that's looking at enforcing any minority rights issue. I, I think too that I think the game companies really could use more people who go in there specifically for like I will help you with diversity you know I here's what here's some ideas of what we could do you know uh, 
Because, I mean, we're still seeing the fact that uh, Remember Me, for example, the game that Capcom's publishing, mm -hmm. how they were saying the fact that the developers went to so many publishers and they're like, well, your game's interesting, but could it be a male character instead of a female character? You know, so we still have a huge problem with diversity in, in the gaming community and development and everything. So we need more people to go in there and say, you know, I want to help you kind of, of think of ways that gaming can be more diverse. So maybe you, maybe even idea is like start your own little firm and be a consultant too, because um, that's, that's a good role that could be played as well. Uh, you could also look into any uh, philanthropic uh, foundation that's deal with gaming. Uh, I understand that the Entertainment uh, Software Association does have diversity-based grants, and they're having a hard time finding applicants for the grants, and you might be the person to help. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. I feel awkward about the question, and I feel the need to preface it with that and also this. Um, <laughs> I grew up reading a subset of fantasy fiction that was all about girls living as boys for years at a time. Mm -hmm. And it was normal, and no one felt the need to explain why they're doing it, because it was like a gender role exclusive job. Mm -hmm. So you just had to pass if you wanted the job. And I don't, I'm, sort of self-indulgently curious about how that actually feels to read as a transgender person. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, um, when I read stories about uh, tomboyish characters, um, you know, often I find it very hard to identify at all uh, with someone who's, you know, rebelling against societal demands to be feminine. So it's very difficult for me to put myself in, you know, in the mindset of a, a tomboy character, um, but uh, you know, occasionally I will read stories where it's a you know, character who is uh, you know reluctantly forced to cross dress in an old Shakespeare play or an old Restoration comedy, and you know these, of course, I, I find just more ridiculous uh, the more times I see this gag being used. I um, interesting story about this. Um, not necessarily relating to the story you're talking about, but. Uh, I've been a fan of Japanese manga for a long time, and there's a manga called Fushigi Yugi, uh, <laughs> who has a character, if I remember correctly, a character who is male, but dressed as, as female, and presented himself as female. Um, and this is before I really knew what was going on with me, and I was reading that comic, and I found out he was male, and I'm like, God, why is the one female character in this story a guy? Like, that sucks so much, you know? Like, I was like, I was like morally and, and, and emotionally hurt by that, you know? Um, but what's interesting is since I figured out what was going on and kind of started dealing with it and being like, okay, this is who I really am, that I, I do find interest in those kind of characters and I find interest in the gender dynamics that can come up. And it is interesting because I think of, you know, you have the Asian cultures where there is a history there of, of kind of cross-dressing in certain, in certain uh, uh, positions or situations mm -hmm. or whatever. And you have these different societies where it's not looked down upon or it's a different subset. So I don't know, I, I, I find them interesting. I, I find it interesting whenever we have characters that can kind of break the norms and present a different side. And, you know, part of it is, is kind of personal for me because uh, I'm, I'm just selfish. I'm like, I want a trans character in every game out there, goddamn it, you know? <laughs> uh, but so it's, it's, it's interesting, I, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, as a cisgendered person, I think that one of the benefits to reading uh, fiction, even from Shakespeare on up, of recognize, because it, it raises the question, you know, under what conditions? Is it by choice? Which I think is a very important question. Um, and how does, how does it shift the way you interact with your microculture? I think it's great. Um, I think, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I'm glad I got to hear the answers. So. Um, so a big sort of schism in modern feminist discourse is trans women, women too, yay, your fight is my fight, or trans women, whoa, we're not touching that. You're women, but I guess you're not women enough, you know, to be with us and for us to take up your banner. So in your experience with women in gaming, the communities that you found, the people that are out there, um, how has that been working out? Which side of the line are they falling on that? Can I speak about it for a minute? Of course. Um, I write for Gaming as Women, which is a, a blog online. 
Uh, we won an any last year, Ooh. Um, and we have we have women on our writing panel who are transgendered, and that's like this is a thing that's very interesting because we have that discussion all the time in terms of you know there are so many issues in terms of access to healthcare, access to jobs, access to all kinds of things that as 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 this ladies mentioned earlier. Um, sorry, I didn't ask first. Uh, the that you you have issues of access that are common. It doesn't matter if you're a cis woman or a transgender woman. You know there are is- issues of access, and then I think you've identified where it breaks down, and that becomes an issue of politics, an issue of personal like where where your your personal politics lie. Um, I lie my more on the access. You know, more access is good. More equality is good. If you're going to stand the fight, if, if, if you're going to stand next to me, I'll stand next to you. Yeah, uh, most of the uh, uh, male to female transsexuals I know in the industry, they're very much in the view that it's their fight, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for you men who've never presented yourself as a woman or been perceived as one, you really don't know the degree of sexism out there until you've really experienced it firsthand. Uh, and I, a couple of our panelists who aren't here today, um, but they, they have said that they've been you know marginalized uh, after making their full transition. It's tough. It's tough because I've seen that that situation. You know, and me personally, like, I have uh, female friends who are gamers who they have been very very accepting. But it there is a weird struggle out there in that in that case, and it's 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 again it's a just tough situation that everybody can't come together and be like you know let's have this fight together versus having to put ourselves in all these little different boxes of, of who we are. So. There's, can I say another thing to that? Sure. Okay. So one more thing in terms of uh, feminism and sex and looking at where first wave feminism and the idea that people could have sex if they wanted and it didn't even matter if they were a woman. If they wanted to have sex, they could. And that was like revolutionary. <laughs> and then you have, then you have a, 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 a sort of second issue co-option where you have the 70s and you have the very beginnings of the AIDS crisis. And you have uh, sex positive feminism being split by uh, conservative viewpoints of you know, all sex is bad because suddenly it could kill you. Um, and this, this we see then... Tr- carrying through through all of the 80s and the 90s of really th- that big split, not just between whether uh, trans win- women are women or not. You know, God, that makes me frustrated just to say. But, but it goes through the whole thing of like, is all porn horrible? Is all penetrative sex rape? You know, all these things that are like, what happened? And what happened was AIDS. And what happened was fear. And if you look at early feminist stuff, it's like, you know, people can have sex if they want. As long as they want it, they can have it. And they, can, they should get equal pay for equal work. And they should all be able to vote and all these other things. But so that, that schism that you're identifying, goes, it's more pervasive, I think, than, than the issue you raised even. Um, so this is why it's a good question and we should keep talking about it. <laughs> We're uh, running a little short on time, so we'll try to get through the next few questions really quickly. Seven minutes. Oh, we have seven more minutes? Okay. You got a minute and a half each. All right, cool. We have a tendency to speak of gender as if it were a binary system as opposed to being on a continuum. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, and especially the folk that self-identify as being in the middle somewhere. I, I know that you're going to want to say about that, but before, <laughs> before you speak up, I want to say real quick, the one thing I want to say is that, you know, be, be who you are. You know, if, if you feel like I'm a, I'm a man's man, that's who you be. If, I, if you're a, a, a prim and proper lady, be that. If you want to be anything in between, you know, be it. You know, and part of what gets brought up in the transgender, transgender conversations are male to female, female to male. There's a lot of grays even between that, you know. There's you know people who want to be androgynous, who feel asexual, who feel like they're both, you know. Just be whoever you want to be, and and you mentioned before that gender can be a fluid thing, and yeah. it's not a it's not a binary, it's not a one or a zero, mm-hmm. you know. And we're we're getting more accepting of that and more understanding of that, but it's still got a lot of ways to go. But it should just be like whatever makes you feel comfortable, even beyond this, just as as a person, as a human being, whatever makes you feel comfortable. As long as it's not like hurting somebody else, you know, then just be that and, and be the person that you want to be. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
I, I kind of wish, I, I really love the words butch and femme. You know, it makes me kind of old school. But it, I do, I like them, because that means that for myself as a cis woman, you know, I can be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just totally feeling really femme today, and I'm going to do the makeup thing and the heels and the nails, and I'm just like going to femme it up and dig it. And other times I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just really enjoying the butch aspect. Because to me, those words, and I'm, God, I'm showing my age. Um, <laughs> to me, those words imply a spectrum. They imply continuity. They imply that I can be where I am in the moment and that that can change. And that can change over the course of the day. It can change over the course of the year. It could change over the course of the hour. You know, whatever. That it's that how you, pr- how you feel is how you feel is good. That's authentic to you. That's what's real for you. And the labels that people put on that is outside of you. And so being able to, uh, to play with those things and acknowledge, like, this is just who I am in this moment. Yeah, that's all. All right. Thank you. Hi. So I have a relatively weird question. So I am cis, but I enjoy cross-dressing. But so recently I bought thigh highs, and my parents were like, you can't wear those out of the house. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't to work here, but whatever. But it's too cool. But, um, so um, how would I get my parents to allow me to cross-dress in public? Because I know my friends wouldn't care. But they're like, oh, you'll see people, people who know us. And I'm like, that shouldn't matter. But, so how would I get them to allow me to do that? What, 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 would, what would you guys do if you were me? <laughs> well, the first issue is you know, your parents love you. And, yeah, sure. <laughs> and you know, they, they will support you. Um, if they're hesitant, they may be because they think you, you know, they're worried that you'll be embarrassed. Or, or that you'll suffer negative. Or you're worried that you'll get hurt. Yes. Yeah. It's, Sorry. I, I don't know that you can make your parents, you know, it's, it's hard to make a parent do something. You have to, uh, I don't know, like that's, that's really tough. You know, I mean, I, I, I have a parent who's accepting, you know, but well, if... My parents you, are okay with, that, with my sexuality, because I'm bisexual, they know that. But um, it's that they don't want me dressing unlike like a woman, which, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I see why they're saying that. And they love me, of course, but um, I wish to, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's tough, yeah I, yeah. I think there's no easy answer, unfortunately. It's, I don't think there is either, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I have, I, have two, I have teenagers. If you want to talk for a minute after, I'll try and <laughs> give you an idea. I don't know if it'll be a good one. <laughs> oh, thank you. I was uh, particularly struck when you were talking about uh, transgenders as the, the butt of the joke kind mm-hmm. of thing, and I was wondering what your opinions are on using humor as a tool for teaching rather than a derisive tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, through a game that's more inclusive rather than derisive, or even in, a, in an individual situation when someone's maybe saying something really horrible and just sort of cracking a joke to stop them in their tracks. Uh, well, in my writing as a, a playwright, I, I use humor uh, to deal with transgender issues, uh, but the, the transvestite characters are never the butt of the joke. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a play where there's a, transvest- where there's a transvestite vigilante, uh, and, you know, he's not the butt of the joke. Um, he's absolutely dead serious on fighting crime and happens to be dressed like a woman while doing it, and all of the good guy characters in that show see nothing wrong with what he's doing. It's only the villains that have a problem. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm MTF. Um, I've, I started transitioning a year ago, and I found that... I, oh, I work in, in the industry, uh, tech industry, but not video games. Um, I found that I've absolutely lost interest in my job ever since starting transition. And do you have any advice, or is how common is that kind of thing? Uh, well, your legal recourse is going to depend on where you live, uh, and um, you know your company will have specific policies as well. No, no, oh, no, no, okay. no your, your question is: you've lost interest. You've lost interest in the I, job. I, I do not know from experience, but I have, I have friends. You know, um, the way hormones affect you are going to be different for every person, but I have friends who were hardcore gamers before they transitioned, and now they just don't care. You know, your, your, your priorities, your, your wants and desires, even, even your sexuality can change through hormones. Um, and those people like, like, like loved games before and they love games after. 
I unfortunately I think it's the same answer as the previous person. I don't think there's a great answer. I think it's just the fact that like people change, you yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, you're blah, blah, blah. What, yes, that, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we are out of time, um, but we're going to be doing... We're going to be doing another panel focusing on transgender characters and the transgender gaming community. Yep. Uh, and that's going to be Sunday at 3. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Sunday, Sunday at 3 o'clock, press XY. And also, there's that pressxy.com up there. If you go there, all of our previous panels are up there in, in either audio and or video form. There is contact information for myself, Charles, previous uh, panelists, you know. Please do not hesitate if you have questions, you know, uh, let one of us two know. Uh, and if we can't answer them, we can get to, to other people, you know. And again, like I said before, don't hesitate to ask questions. And, you know, because if you want to know, then we want you to know. Yes. All right. Thank you for coming. Yeah.